to the clinical anatomy section that begins the discussion of the abdomen. Today we'll start by looking at the viscera of the abdomen or the organs in the abdomen, including the esophagus, the stomach, and the small intestine. The esophagus, just the terminal esophagus or the very end of the esophagus, the stomach and the intestines um, are the abdominal viscera that are part of the gastrointestinal tract. When I say intestines, I mean both the small and the large intestine. If you look over here at the picture, um, this tube that's really tightly curved in the center of the abdomen, this is the small intestine. And then all around the outsides of the abdomen, is the large intestine. The small intestine is called small because its diameter is much smaller. The diameter of the small intestine is about an inch, and then the diameter of the large intestine is like two and a half inches. So that's why it's called large. The small intestine is actually much longer. Um, you've got over 20 feet of small intestine in a, in a cadaver when it's relaxed, it's over 20 feet. Um, but over 20 feet of tube all curled up in the abdomen. So it is quite long. Um, small, again, just refers to diameter versus large diameter in the large intestine. Again, the esophagus, stomach, and intestines are part of the gastrointestinal tract. So they're part of the digestive system where we digest food and absorb nutrients. Most digestion of food occurs in the stomach and in the duodenum. Um, the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. We'll see that the small intestine is broken up into three parts, the duodenum, then the jejunum, then the ileum. And so the duodenum and the stomach are where most digestion of food um, occurs. Once we digest the food, we have um, nutrients that we need to absorb. Most absorption of nutrients, um, vitamins, and minerals is occurring in the small intestine. The reason for that is simply surface area. Um, there is a huge surface area in the small intestine because of, one, the length of the small intestine, but then also because the mucosa is arranged in villi or little finger-like projections. And then on those villi, we have microvilli. So there's a huge surface area in the small intestine, and that huge surface area allows for absorption of all of the nutrients. Um, the reabsorption of water, however, occurs later in the digestive tract. When um, throughout the whole digestive tract, we put liters and liters of water into the tube. So starting with saliva and down to gastric juices in the stomach, uh, pancreatic juices and bile, um, intestinal juices, we put liters of water into the intestines and we reabsorb most of that water back. The reabsorption of that water occurs primarily in the ascending colon, which is part of the large intestine. It's the part of the large intestine that you see right here that ascends. If the water does not get absorbed, in the large intestine. For example, if the fecal contents are rushed through the large intestine too quickly and we don't have time for that water absorption to occur, that's when the stool becomes watery. So for example, um, in conditions where there's diarrhea, the water remains in the stool and there's a large volume of stool and it's a really liquid stool because there was not enough time for this water absorption, water reabsorption to occur in the ascending colon. Okay, so the esophagus, stomach, and intestine are part of the actual gastrointestinal tract. The pancreas and liver and gallbladder are also associated with digestion. They're just not actually part of the tract itself. Right? So they're not part of the canal that the, the food goes through. They're accessory structures that are related to digestion. The pancreas and liver specifically are glands that make secretions that get put into the um, digestive tract. So the pancreas makes pancreatic juice, 
that we'll see has bicarbonate um, to neutralize acid, and then it has enzymes as well to digest food. And the liver makes bile that has wastes in it that we want to get rid of, but it also has bile salts that help in the digestion of um, fats or lipids. Um, now the pancreas and the liver make their glands, they make these secretions to help with digestion. Um, but I have the gallbladder here in parentheses because the gallbladder is closely associated with the liver. Um, the liver makes bile, but the bile then gets transported to the gallbladder and it's stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. Then when the gallbladder, um, the gallbladder releases that bile into the digestive tract. So the gallbladder isn't necessarily um, making the secretion itself, but it is helping the liver in the release of that secretion. So I do include it here um, in the same area, the pancreas and the liver. Um, where the, pan um, where the, the pancreatic juice and the bile get released into the digestive tract, they get released into the duodenum, which the duodenum, remember, we set up here was the first part of the small intestine. And they get released via a system of ducts. Um, the pancreas has the pancreatic duct, um, or the, more specifically, the main pancreatic duct that empties into the duodenum, and then the bile duct comes from the gallbladder and empties into the duodenum. The um, spleen and kidneys and suprarenal glands are also present in the abdomen. Um, the, these, the spleen, kidneys, and suprarenal glands can't be seen well um, in this picture because they're actually located posterior to the organs that we're looking at. Um, the spleen, you can kind of see poking out a little bit over here. The kidneys are um, in, they're located retroperitoneally or behind the peritoneal, um, the peritoneal cavity, peritoneal membrane. And the suprarenal glands, or they're also called the adrenal glands, are located on the top of each of the kidneys. Um, the arterial supply to all of the abdominal viscera or the abdominal organs comes from the abdominal aorta and its branches. Um, the three major branches that come off of the abdominal aorta to go to the abdominal viscera include the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric, artery, and then the inferior mesenteric artery. And that's in order um, from superficial to, um, <clears throat> or sorry, from superior to inferior. So right when we go past the diaphragm into the abdominal cavity, the first branch is the celiac trunk. Right? Inferior to the celiac trunk has the superior mesenteric artery, and then down further is the inferior mesenteric artery. Venous drainage from the abdominal viscera is via the hepatic portal system. Um, portal blood flow is different from normal blood flow because typically we go from artery to capillary to vein, right? Um, but in portal blood flow, we go from one capillary bed and then a vein, the portal vein, brings us to another capillary bed and then the blood leaves via a typical regular vein. So in portal blood flow, we have two capillary beds that are linked by portal veins. We see this happens with the abdominal viscera. Um, the hepatic portal venous system includes all of the veins that collect blood um, from the abdominal parts of the GI tract, um, so the intestines, the, um, in the stomach, the spleen, pancreas, and gallbladder and then all of that blood gets transported to a second capillary bed in the liver. And then the liver processes that blood, um, and then it leaves the liver via the hepatic veins and goes into the inferior vena cava. Um, we'll look at the specific veins that are, that are there, um, but the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein are two of the largest veins, and those merge together to form the hepatic portal vein. 
and then the hepatic portal vein takes blood into the liver. But again, we'll look at all of that in a little bit. So we'll start with the esophagus. The esophagus is a 10 inch muscular tube that connects the pharynx with the stomach. Okay, so specifically it connects the laryngopharynx, the very bottom of the pharynx, with the cardia of the stomach. The cardia is the very beginning of the stomach. When we look at the esophagus, it's 10 inches long, but very little of it is actually present um, in the abdomen. Most of it is present in the thoracic cavity or in the thorax. When we look at the esophagus, the esophagus is curved. It follows the curve of the thoracic spine. Remember, that's referred to as the thoracic kyphosis. Right? It's a curve that curves back and out away from the body. So the esophagus just follows that curvature as it progresses through the thorax. The esophagus enters the abdominal cavity through the diaphragm and the, um, the opening in the diaphragm that it passes through is referred to as the esophageal hiatus. Okay, so it passes through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm to enter into the abdominal cavity. Um, the esophageal hiatus is just left of the median plane at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra, so at the level of T10. The diaphragm forms a, um, a circular band of muscle or a thickening of the muscle that acts as a sphincter around the esophagus um, where it passes through the esophageal hiatus. We refer to this as the inferior esophageal sphincter or it's also called the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, the inferior esophageal sphincter opens to allow a bolus of food to pass through into the stomach, um, but when there's no food passing through, the inferior esophageal sphincter um, tightens or closes and that acts to form a lid on top of the stomach. So the inferior esophageal sphincter um, works to keep gastric contents in the stomach. And this is really important if you think about the fact that the pH in the stomach is very, very low. Right? The stomach uses hydrochloric acid in order to help activate enzymes and break down and digest food. So this hydrochloric acid um, is okay in the stomach. The stomach is meant to deal with it, but the esophagus is not meant to deal with it. Um, the esophagus should not have acid in it. Um, so this inferior esophageal sphincter, right, this tightening around the bottom of the esophagus is important at keeping that acid and all of the gastric contents down in the stomach. Um, and typically it does during certain pathologies like GERD, right, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, that lower esophageal sphincter is not efficient at keeping the acid down in the stomach and the acid actually washes up into the esophagus and we'll talk about that um, we'll talk about that a little bit later and the problems that that can cause so um, the esophagus enters into the abdominal cavity through the esophageal hiatus at about the level of t10 then um, the esophagus goes into the stomach at what we call the esophagogastric junction. The esophagal like esophagus, gastric referring to the stomach. So the junction between the esophagus and the stomach is the esophagogastric junction. This is again just to the left of midline at the level of the seventh costal cartilage um, or the level of the T11 vertebrae or vertebra. So if you look at this, there's not very much of the esophagus that's present in the abdomen. We said most of the esophagus is up in the thorax. 
um, the section that's in the abdomen just goes from about the level of T10 where it enters to about the level of T11 where it terminates at the stomach. Um, interiorly, when we look at the interior of the, of the esophagus, there's an abrupt change where the esophageal mucosa turns to the gastric mucosa. And the mucosa, remember, is just the lining. So the lining of the esophagus abruptly changes to the gastric lining or the, the lining of the stomach. Again, I said they're very different from each other because they have very different functions. Um, this line where it changes from the esophageal mucosa to the gastric mucosa is referred to as the Z line. The esophagus is located retroperitoneal. Retroperitoneal just means behind the peritoneum. You, um, you're behind the peritoneal cavity. Remember, the peritoneum is the double layer membrane that's present um, throughout the abdomen and part of the pelvis and some structures are located retroperitoneal or behind the peritoneum, behind the peritoneal cavity. Um, the terminal esophagus happens to be one of those. The esophagus, um, the, the lining or the wall of the esophagus concludes two layers of, um, two layers of muscle, just like most of the GI tract does. There's a longitudinal layer and a circular layer of muscle. Um, again, the rest of the, the GI tract, so the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, um, <clears throat> also have two layers of muscle present in the wall. The stomach is the only caveat here. We'll see that the stomach actually has three layers. There's the third layer of, stomach, of muscle in the stomach. When we look at the esophagus, sorry, I'm running out of room, so I'll write up top. Um, when we look at the esophagus, we see that the muscle changes from skeletal muscle to smooth muscle as we progress from the top to the bottom. So the top third of the esophagus is striated skeletal muscle. Um, the middle third is mixed. And the inferior third is smooth muscle. Okay, so here we see the esophagus right, leading down into the stomach. The diaphragm is right here. Remember the diaphragm forms um, the border between the thorax on the top and the abdomen on the bottom. Um, looking at the esophagus, like the, the top of this esophagus here is all in the thorax. The part of the esophagus that's in the abdomen is not very long. There's not very much of it um, actually down in the abdomen. The Z line you can see here Okay, so the Z line is this line right here where the mucosa or the inner lining abruptly changes. Okay, so you see the esophageal mucosa lining the esophagus up here, and then you can see the gastric mucosa or the mucosa of the stomach, which is highly folded um, down below the Z line. Arterial supply to the esophagus is via the left inferior phrenic artery which you see down here, and then majorly from the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery. The left gastric artery is right here, and then the esophageal branches branch off to the esophagus. Um, the left gastric artery is a branch of the celiac trunk.
And we said the celiac trunk was like the first major branch off of the abdominal aorta. Okay, so up here is the thoracic aorta. Um, once we're inferior to the diaphragm, this becomes the abdominal aorta. The celiac trunk is this little like section right here. It's a trunk, so like it just comes off and then branches in multiple directions. So the celiac trunk itself is very small. It's just that first initial, um, the first initial vessel that is coming off of the aorta. It doesn't continue for very long. Um, the celiac trunk then branches, and we have the common hepatic artery going over to the liver, the splenic artery going to the spleen, and the left gastric artery okay, that goes up, and it goes to the stomach, hence being called gastric, but it also has esophageal branches that go to the esophagus. Um, venous drainage from the esophagus um, down in the abdominal part goes into portal circulation. But venous drainage from the proximal part of the esophagus, the part that's up in the thorax, drains into systemic venous circulation. So just regular venous circulation. Um, and this is via esophageal veins. The esophageal veins drain into the azygous vein. And you can see that up top. Here. So these are all esophageal veins on the esophagus, and you can see them draining into the azygous vein, which is this large vein right here. The inferior distal portions of the esophagus that are located down in the abdomen, which is really what we're focusing on right now, um, drain into the hepatic portal vein and this is via the left gastric vein. So kind of like the opposite of the arterial blood flow. Um, <clears throat> so you can see here the left gastric vein flowing into the hepatic portal vein. So the hepatic portal vein is, is really made by this large fusion between the superior mesenteric vein and then this way is the splenic vein. Right after those merge, you see the left gastric vein, a really small one, entering into the hepatic portal vein. And the hepatic portal brain, vein is bringing blood into the liver to be processed. There are um, multiple connections between the veins that drain the esophagus proximally and distally. Um, and this presents a, an anastomosis or a connection between systemic veins and portal veins. Okay, so this is a point of portosystemic anastomosis, which can be important clinically. Lymphatic drainage from the esophagus um, is via the left gastric nodes, they would flow into the celiac nodes. And the nodes are located right by the arteries of the same name. Um, so the left gastric nodes are right here, by where the left gastric artery is. And then the celiac nodes are right here, right by where the celiac trunk is. And the celiac nodes really take um, drainage from all of the other lymph nodes in the area. Innervation to the esophagus is both parasympathetic and sympathetic. So parasympathetic, we see up here, via the vagus nerves, and then the sympathetic we see down here via the sympathetic trunks. So let's look at parasympathetic first. We said parasympathetic innervation is from the vagus nerve. And here we see the vagus nerves coming down. And the vagus nerves become vagal trunks. Um, the vagal trunks, we have an anterior vagal trunk in the front and a posterior vagal trunk that goes down the back of the esophagus and then the front and back of the stomach. Um, the right vagus nerve becomes the posterior vagal trunk and the left vagus nerve becomes the anterior vagal trunk. These look like flip-flopped. This picture is, is not a great picture because it looks like the left is on the right. Um, but the words are right. The words are correct. And I'll show you, uh, I'll show you a better picture on the next slide. Um, but again, the, the left vagus nerve 
becomes the left vagal trunk, which is going to like go down the front of the esophagus. And then the right goes down the back of the esophagus. And that gives way to the esophageal plexus, right? the nerves of the esophagus. And then again, those are going to turn into anterior and posterior gastric nerves. So the anterior vagal trunk goes into the anterior gastric nerves, which you'll see here all along the front of the stomach. The posterior vagal trunk becomes posterior gastric nerves, which these little dotted lines are representing in the back of the stomach. Okay, so that's the parasympathetic input to the esophagus and the stomach um, from the vagus nerve. The sympathetic input, we said, is from the sympathetic trunks, right? They go down either side of the spinal cord throughout the thorax. So the thoracic sympathetic trunks are going to give us the splanchnic nerves. Right? We have a, um, a greater and lesser splanchnic nerve, which you see coming off of the sympathetic trunk. So the greater splanchnic nerve comes off the sympathetic trunk right here and ends up innervating um, sympathetic innervation to the esophagus. Okay, so these pictures are really busy, um, but they're a little bit more accurate. Over here, you see the vagus nerves. Right? So the left vagus nerve right here. And then over on the other side, you see the right vagus nerve. If you follow the left vagus nerve down, Okay, you see it gives way to these um, the esophageal plexus, right? All of these nerves um, of the esophagus, and then it turns into the anterior vagal trunk. So notice that it, it was on the left side, but then it crosses and it comes medially, and now it's located medially in front of the esophagus. So if we look over here, we should see anterior vagal trunk. Then that anterior vagal trunk. It comes down and we're going to see branches that become um, the anterior gastric nerves, right? They go on the front of the stomach. Um, on the back, um, the posterior vagal trunk comes from the right vagus nerve. So over here, this was the right vagus nerve and we can see it kind of disappears. Okay, it goes back behind the esophagus as the posterior vagal trunk. Um, and then again, it ends up going down back behind the stomach as well. A hiatal hernia occurs when part of the stomach protrudes up into the thorax. So the stomach should be below the diaphragm completely in the abdomen. Um, but sometimes, because of a, a weakening of the diaphragm or a widening of the uh, esophageal hiatus, the opening in the diaphragm that the esophagus comes through, um, sometimes because of a, a widening in that area, the stomach can push up or protrude up through the esophageal hiatus right, and into the thorax, specifically the mediastinum. They're in the middle of the thorax. This typically occurs after middle age because after middle age is when the diaphragm starts to weaken um, and then it's not as good of a barrier keeping the stomach down in the abdomen. If we want to visualize this radiographically, um, we can do this with a barium swallow. It allows us to visualize um, the digestive tract and you can see that here. Right, so like stomach down here the esophagus is up here this is um the area that should be down here the diaphragm so you can see that it's protruded up through the hiatus right the opening right here and all of this should be down in the abdomen it should not be up through the diaphragm in the thorax um, there are multiple types of hiatal hernia. Paraesophageal um, is less common. A paraesophageal we see right here. Okay, so paraesophageal, like by the 
esophagus, next to the esophagus. Here you see part of the stomach has protruded up and it's next to the esophagus. So it's herniated, it's, it's up in the wrong spot, um, but part of the stomach is next to the esophagus. The most common type is a sliding hiatal hernia, um, and that's when everything just slides straight up. So the esophagus is up, part of the stomach just pushes straight up underneath the esophagus as opposed to next to the esophagus. Um, small hernias are typically asymptomatic. However, large hernias um, can be bothersome. They can result in regurgitation of stomach contents, so gastric contents or stomach contents being regurgitated back up, um, burping or belching, pain, discomfort. Um, again, the larger the hernia is, the more symptomatic it becomes. Here we see um, details of the paraesophageal hiatal hernia, which um, paraesophageal, again, is less common. Then the sliding hiatal hernia. With paraesophageal hiatal hernias, the cardia remains in the normal position. The cardia is the very beginning of the stomach or the, the entry of the stomach. And you can see that here. Okay, so the esophagus comes down, we go through the diaphragm, and then the cardio or entrance into the stomach is in the right area. So the food can come down the esophagus, it can go through the sphincter, go into the stomach, okay. However, um, there's a pouch of peritoneum, like the membrane that surrounds the stomach, and um, sometimes part of the stomach as well, specifically the fundus, which we'll see is like the, the bulb of the stomach up top. So if you look at the stomach, there's this little like rounded area up top. So part of um, a little pouch of peritoneum and sometimes the fundus as well extends up through the esophageal hiatus, the opening of the diaphragm, and it sits right by the esophagus. So the esophagus is in the right spot. The entrance to the stomach is in the right spot. It's just there's extra space in the opening in the hiatus. So part of the peritoneum, part of the stomach can kind of sneak up through that and sit next to um, or adjacent to the esophagus. There's typically no regurgitation of the gastric contents with paraesophageal. And this is because the cardial orifice is in the right position. Okay, so again, we said that when food is being swallowed, the food goes through the sphincter and into the cardia and into the stomach. And then the sphincter is able to close and the gastric contents are kept down in the stomach. This is not the case always with a sliding hiatal hernia. A sliding hiatal hernia is the most common type of hiatal hernia. Um, in a sliding hiatal hernia, everything just slides up through the hiatus or the opening in the diaphragm. So the abdominal esophagus or the part of the esophagus that should be down in the abdomen, uh, the cardia, which is just the first part of the stomach, and then sometimes parts of the fundus, the little bulb of the stomach that's up top, um, all just slide up through the hiatus. Um, this is worsened when laying down or bending over. Um, like when you bend over, for example, that increases the pressure in the abdomen. Um, and then also gravity is not on your side when you hunger. 
and it can worsen or increase um, the amount that slides up into the thorax. When or in a sliding hiatal hernia, it is possible to regurgitate gastric contents. So this is more symptomatic when it comes to regurgitation. And the reason for that is that the cardia is no longer, or cardial orifice, the entrance into the stomach is no longer in the correct place. Um, <clears throat> with paraesophageal, there is a herniation over here, but the entrance into the stomach is in the right place. So you still have a functioning inferior esophageal sphincter and the food is still kept down in the stomach. The gastric contents are still kept down in the stomach. But in a sliding hiatal hernia, everything has been pushed up. Um, so you no longer have an appropriately functioning um, inferior esophageal sphincter or it doesn't function as well. So regurgitation of um, gastric contents is much more likely. Okay, so now we can move on to the stomach. The stomach is located in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen, and it's partially um, located within the thoracic cage. So parts of it are protected by the ribs and the costal cartilages. Parts of it project more medially and are not enclosed within the gastric cage. The stomach functions to store food um, because we do eat a big meal at a time and we need somewhere to put that large meal and begin to process it um, before we then pass little bits at a time into the small intestine. So the stomach acts one as a storage site where we can put that big meal um, that we eat all at once. It also mixes the food with gastric juices and this helps to dissolve the food and instead of having um, solid bites of food, we have a semi-liquid substance, kind of like a milkshake, that we refer to as chyme. Uh, gastric juices um, include water. There are liters of gastric juices. So um, water is the main component. But then in that, we also have things like hydrochloric acid, right? hydrogen and chloride, um, or hydrochloric acid. That's what makes the pH in the stomach so acidic. Um, this acid is important. It helps to break down some um, things like um, the connective tissues, for example, that are present in animal products that we eat. So the hydrochloric acid can break things down itself. Um, it also activates enzymes. So for example, gastric juices include something called pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is inactive. It's not um, able to digest anything. However, once it gets into an acidic environment in the stomach, so because of this hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen gets activated into pepsin. And pepsin actively breaks down proteins or digests proteins. So the hydrochloric acid um, can break things down itself. It can activate other enzymes that further break down um, food that we eat. And the acidic environment is protective as well. Um, think about all of the pathogens that go into our mouth. Now, very many of them can live in an acidic environment. So the hydrochloric acid that's present in the gastric juice um, does have a protective component as well. Okay, so we've got gastric juices. There's um, a lot of water that goes in, again, just to help um, dissolve and liquefy the food. There's hydrochloric acid, um, there's pepsinogen, and all of, um, or multiple different products that go in to help the process of digestion. Once the stomach has begun this process and has produced this um, kind of liquidy substance called chyme, the chyme gets passed in through the pyloric orifice. Okay, so through this opening right here, and it gets passed into the duodenum. Again, the duodenum or duodenum, you'll hear sometimes, um, is the first part of the small intestine. When we look at the stomach, um, the stomach wall is composed of three layers of muscle. Remember, most of the GI tract or the um, most of the alimentary canal 
only has two layers of muscle present in the wall. The stomach has three layers. So this does allow for some extra um, rippling motions or some extra mixing motions that the other parts of the GI tract are not capable of. When we look at the stomach from the outside, we see these two major curves that are present. They're referred to as the greater curvature and the lesser curvature. So the lesser curvature is the short concave border, the um, superior border that's on the top of the stomach, and the greater curvature is the long convex border of the stomach that's located more inferiorly um, on the stomach. When we look at these curves, we'll see that there are um, membrane-type tissues that extend from each of the curves, and they're referred to as the greater omentum and the lesser omentum. The greater omentum extends from the greater curvature, um, and an omentum is like it's a double-layered membrane. It's an extension from the peritoneum. So the peritoneum, um, remember, is the, the double layer membrane that's present around the organs in the peritoneal cavity. Um, the omentum is just another double layered extension. It's kind of a fatty um, extension of the peritoneum. And the omentum connects the stomach and duodenum to other organs. And it kind of acts to um, help anchor and give support to the stomach and the duodenum. So the greater omentum, um, we said, extends from the greater curvature, and then it connects to um, the diaphragm and the spleen. It extends down and fuses with the peritoneum of the transverse colon and the mesentery that we'll see is present around the small intestine. Okay, so extends from the greater curvature to multiple other organs. The lesser omentum, we said, goes from the lesser curvature. Okay, so the lesser omentum is an extension of the peritoneum that begins here at the lesser curvature, and then it connects to the liver. So it goes up to the liver. And that connection between the lesser curvature and the liver is referred to as the hepatogastric ligament. Um, oh, also, when we look inside the stomach, note all of the folds that are present in the mucosa. Um, those are referred to as rugae, or they're also called gastric folds. Again, we, we don't like graze on little bits all day long. We sit down and we eat a big meal and we need somewhere to store that meal. If you think about the rest of the GI tract, the rest of the GI tract is a relatively thin tube. So we can't cram a big meal, right? A bunch of mass into it at one time. The stomach, however, acts as a storage chamber. The stomach can hold a big meal all at once. And the way that it does that is because it has the ability to stretch. The reason that the stomach can stretch without damaging its lining or damaging its mucosa is because of all of the folds that are present. Okay, so all of these folds in the mucosa, which again we call rugae or gastric folds, allow for a stretching of the stomach to occur when it's filled with a large meal, um, a lot of liquid. The stomach can be broken up into four major sections or four major parts. We've already mentioned the cardia and the fundus, um, but the cardia is the initial segment of the stomach. Clear the first part of the stomach, a very little first part of the stomach. It's literally just the area that surrounds the cardial orifice or the opening into the stomach that the food passes through as it goes from the esophagus into the stomach. So just that first little part. 
Now, a kind of swollen dome or, or bulb on the top of the stomach is referred to as the fundus, right? So the dilated superior most part. The fundus extends from the left dome of the diaphragm, right? The, the like, curved part of the diaphragm on the left down to the horizontal plane of the cardial orifice. So from the very top of the stomach down to the opening of the cardial orifice is the fundus. Um, the fundus, again, is just kind of like an extra storage chamber or area. It can be dilated or it can swell by excess food or liquid or gas that can accumulate up in the area. The cardiac notch refers to the little indentation in the stomach that's present between the esophagus and the fundus. So if we look at like the esophagus coming down and then the stomach kind of going like this. Okay, so the cardia is the entrance right into the stomach that's like right here. And then if you draw a line over from that, this top region is the fundus. The body is the main part of the stomach. So like all of this um, is the body. And then the last funnel shaped region or it's um, kind of a J shaped area of the stomach is the pyloric part of the stomach. So again, the funnel shaped region that kind of it thins out as the stomach heads towards the small intestine. The pyloric part can be broken up into the pyloric antrum, um, which is the wide part. And then the pyloric canal, which is the narrow part. The pylorus refers to the thickening of the circular muscle that functions as a sphincter around the pyloric orifice. So the pyloric orifice is the opening that goes into the duodenum. So the opening that goes into the duodenum, right, that food or chyme rather passes through as it goes from the stomach into the duodenum. That's the pyloric orifice. The pylorus is the sphincter around that orifice. Okay, so you could say sphincter um, around that orifice. Um, and this is important because remember we said that the stomach acts as a storage chamber and a whole meal can go into the stomach at once. We can't shove that entire meal from the stomach into the duodenum at one time. Then there's a few reasons for this. One, the duodenum is smaller, right? The small intestine is much thinner, so it simply can't hold um, an entire meal being crammed into it at once. But um, in addition to this, um, structural reason. There's also functionally, if you think about it, the stomach is extremely acidic, right? All of the chyme and the contents in the stomach, we've pumped a bunch of hydrochloric acid into it. So it has a very low pH and the stomach is equipped to deal with that. The very first part of the duodenum can handle small amounts of acid at a time, but it quickly neutralizes that acid. So before the, um, <clears throat> the contents get pushed through the rest of the small intestine, we neutralize the chyme, we neutralize all of the acid. We can only do that to small little bits of chyme at a time. If um, there was not a sphincter present in the pylorus and all of the food just went into the stomach and then flew on through the small intestine, um, we would damage the small intestine. So the pylorus um, is important, that sphincter function is important in allowing um, you know, smaller amounts of chyme to go through into the duodenum when it's appropriate. So here we see the stomach. You see, this is the diaphragm up here. And the liver's been pulled back so we can see better. But this is showing us the esophagus, the abdominal part of the esophagus leading into the stomach. And then here we see this is the stomach. The cardia 
um, is this first initial section of the stomach. Okay, so the food passes from the esophagus through the cardia and into the body of the stomach. So this whole region is the body, the main region of the stomach. The fundus refers to this area up here, the dome-shaped area. Again, it extends up to the left dome of the diaphragm. And then the inferior border of the fundus is at the cardial orifice. And so the opening into the stomach is right here, and that marks the transition from the fundus to the body. This last funnel-shaped part is the pyloric part. Again, the pyloric antrum is like the wide part right here. And then where it narrows, it's the pyloric canal. The pylorus refers to the sphincter right here, or it's also called the pyloric sphincter. And that controls flow from the stomach, from the stomach into the duodenum, right? And this is the duodenum, the first section of the small intestine. Um, from the, this is the lesser curvature, right? And then the other side's the greater curvature. From the lesser curvature, you can see the lesser omentum. Okay, so the lesser omentum is this entire area. It goes from the lesser curvature, and then remember it also does connect to the duodenum. We said this section that goes from the lesser curvature up to the liver um, is referred to as the hepatogastric ligament. There is also a hepatic du um, duodenal ligament. Um, duodenal, sorry. I'm trying to erase this. So if you look at this whole, this whole thing is the lesser omentum. Right, this area that connects to the lesser curvature, that's what we talked about earlier, is the hepatogastric ligament. This little thickened section right here that connects to the duodenum, the first section of the small intestine, is the hepatoduodenal ligament. And then the hepatogastric ligament. connects to the lesser curvature. Both of those things together give us the lesser omentum. The greater omentum is like a thicker kind of fattier membrane, but the greater omentum connects to the greater curvature and the duodenum. And this is showing you the greater omentum. The greater omentum comes over here and connects to the spleen. Um, it comes down and connects to, um, or kind of wraps around the transverse colon. It connects to the mesentery, which is a little bit um, more inferior to that. But again, all of this um, helps to support the stomach and the duodenum. Because remember, like think about it, other organs have bones and, and, and tendons and muscles that are all around them, supporting them, keeping them in place. The abdominal viscera is pretty open, right? It's pretty soft. There are a lot of organs just kind of crammed in there. So the um, omentum, the mesentery, all of these membranes are important to help give structure and form to the organs and organization to the organs that are present in the abdomen. Arterial supply to the stomach um, comes almost entirely from branches off of the celiac trunk. Um, these branches form connections or anastomoses along the lesser curvature and along the greater curvature of the stomach. So the left gastric artery and the um, right gastric artery meet up or anastomose along the lesser curvature. 
and you can see that here. Um, the right gastric artery and then the left gastric arteries. The greater curvature um, has anastomosis has an anastomosis from the right and left gastroomental arteries, or they're um, also called gastroepiploic arteries. So all of these originally come from the um, celiac trunk. So the left gastric artery comes straight off the celiac trunk itself. The right gastric artery and the right gastroomental artery come from the hepatic artery. And the hepatic artery is one of the branches of the celiac trunk. The left gastroomental comes from the splenic. But again, the splenic is from the celiac trunk. Um, so here, this is the celiac trunk, right? Remember the first big branch off of the abdominal aorta. The left gastric artery is a branch from the celiac trunk, right? And you see it coming around the lesser curvature. Over here, this is the common hepatic artery right here. So that's the common hepatic artery. The common hepatic artery gives rise to the right gastric artery. Okay? And then the right gastric artery and left gastric artery anastomose. This hepatic artery also gives us our right, um, our right gastroepiploic, or remember that was the gastroomental. So here you see the, the celiac trunk, the common hepatic artery, and then down here, right, our right um, gastroomental. We said the left gastroomental comes from the splenic. Um, again, we start at the celiac trunk. The splenic, you can see over here, going behind the stomach, right? And then the left gastroomental comes from the splenic. So major branches off of the celiac trunk are the left gastric, the splenic, and the common hepatic, right? Those all give way um, to the four vessels that anastomose to give arterial supply to most of the stomach. Um, this over here, um, is less kind of anatomically beautiful, um, but it breaks it down really simply. It makes it easy to understand because of um, like how separated and clear everything is. So you see the abdominal aorta, right, is the large vessel that goes down the midline of the abdomen, here the medial plane of the abdomen. The first um, really big major branch in the abdomen is the celiac trunk. Again, that's really short because it quickly um, truncates or branches. You see that common hepatic artery going over here towards the liver and towards the right. And then um, relatively quickly, that branches to give us the right gastric artery. Later on, um, that gives us the gastroduodenal artery, right? Um, but we care right now because that gives us the right gastroomental artery, right between the stomach and the omentum. Another branch off the celiac trunk is the left gastric artery, which you see right here. And then the last one was the splenic artery going to the spleen. The splenic artery also gives us our left gastroomental artery. Um, there are also... Um, there are also, sorry, short gastric arteries that come off of the splenic artery. Uh, venous drainage from the stomach is via the hepatic portal circulation. Okay, so um, remember the portal vein is formed by the superior mesenteric vein, which you see here and then the splenic vein, which comes from the spleen. And those merge to form the hepatic portal vein, which goes to the liver. There are veins um, <clears throat> that match the arteries, and these all eventually flow back um, into the hepatic portal vein. So you see um, left and right gastric veins. There are left and right gastroomental veins. There's a short gastric vein. 
right? And then um, either by flowing into the superior mesenteric vein or into the splenic vein, they end up feeding into the hepatic portal vein, which again brings that blood into the liver. Nerve supply to the stomach, um, again, is just like we saw in the esophagus, it's parasympathetic and sympathetic. Um, and parasympathetic is mainly vagal via the anterior vagal trunk and the posterior vagal trunk. Um, the anterior vagal trunk, remember we said, is from the left vagal nerve, and the posterior vagal trunk is from the right vagal nerve um, or vagus nerve. And here you can see the gastric branches, right? So the anterior vagal trunk um, gives us the anterior gastric branches. The posterior vagal trunk gives us the posterior vagal branches. Uh, sympathetic supply to the stomach is from the T6 through T9 spinal cord segments. And this gets to the stomach again um, from the greater splanchnic nerves. So those come from the sympathetic trunks. And so you see the sympathetic trunks and um, the greater splanchnic nerve come off of the sympathetic trunk. And then also um, celiac plexus. The celiac plexus refers to um, the nerves that come and go all around the celiac trunk and then the branches of the celiac trunk. So they follow the vessels that come from the celiac trunk um, as they head towards the abdominal organs. Carcinoma of the stomach is a cancer of the stomach. Um, tumors that are present in the body or pylorus of the stomach may be palpable, um, but the cardia and fundus of the stomach lie deep to the costal cartilages and the ribs, so they're not easily palpable. And you can see that if you look over here, um, like looking at the stomach, the body and pylorus are down here. Um, the cardian fundus are up here, so they're deep to the costal cartilages and the ribs and the liver as well. The left lobe of the liver lies over um, parts of the, the cardia. So if the tumor is present in the body or the part of the pylorus, you might be able to palpate it um, along the midline or just left of the midline. The pylorus is at the level of the ninth costal cartilage at the midline. And then the body would be just left and superior to that. Gastroscopy um, is a way that we can visualize the mucosa of the stomach to look for abnormalities. Gastroscopy, in gastroscopy, we utilize a gastroscope to visualize the stomach and we inflate the stomach with air first. Um, inflating the stomach with air stretches it out and then that allows for visualization, um, a flattening of the rugae and a better visualization of the mucosa of the stomach. We can also take a biopsy of a gastric lesion if we do see something abnormal that we want to biopsy. A partial gastric gastrectomy is removal of the part of the stomach that was involved in the carcinoma. So the part of the stomach that has cancerous tissue present um, is removed. When removing part of the stomach, the arteries to the affected area can be ligated or tied off without affecting blood flow to the other areas of the stomach. And the reason for this is that um, most of the arteries anastomose allowing blood flow to continue to the unaffected areas. When um, carcinoma of the stomach occurs, you typically need to remove the regional lymph nodes as well because of metastasis. 
Cancer is most frequently present, present in the pyloric region of the stomach. So when we're removing lymph nodes, it's um, typically the pyloric lymph nodes that are removed, as well as the right gastro-omental lymph nodes, because those are just upstream of the pyloric lymph nodes. If the stomach cancer is advanced, it might require removal of the celiac lymph nodes. Um, the celiac lymph nodes receive lymph flow from all gastric nodes. So regardless of where the cancer is, if it's advanced, um, removal of the celiac nodes would be necessary. Here you see all different types of gastrect gastrectomies that can occur. Um, again, just depending on the area of the stomach that's been affected. Um, but the part of the stomach that has cancerous tissue is removed and then the other areas are just reconnected. And in some cases, it's just um, a small part of the stomach as you see here with this wedge gastre gastrectomy um, where part of the body of the stomach has been removed. Right here you see a whole central region has been removed, but then the other parts will just be reconnected to each other, essentially just shortening the stomach. Okay, here um, the proximal region has been removed. In this case, um, the distal region has been removed, so the um, pylorus and part of the body have been removed. Subtotal is when almost the entire stomach um, is being removed, and then a total gastrectomy is when the entire stomach is removed. And then in this case, the esophagus um, just gets connected directly to the duodenum. Here we see all of the lymph nodes that are present in the stomach. And then I've also highlighted those lymph nodes that are typically involved with stomach cancers, specifically um, carcinoma that would occur in the pyloric region. Uh, just to look at the nodes to begin with, um, the celiac lymph nodes are the nodes that are around the celiac trunk. Uh, again, those receive drainage from all of the other gastric nodes. The gastric lymph nodes um, occur along the lesser curvature, which is where the gastric arteries are. The pyloric lymph nodes occur along the pyloric region of the stomach. Um, the gastro-omental nodes occur along the, uh, the greater curvature of the stomach, where the gastro-omental arteries are. The other two arteries are um, also named for the pancreas, so just think about where the pancreas is located. The head of the pancreas is here, right in the little curve that's created by the duodenum, and then the pancreas stretches out behind the stomach, and the tail comes over to the spleen, which would be over here. So when you look at these other two nodes, down here, these nodes are pancreaticoduodenal, okay, because the head of the pancreas is there, and then this part of the small intestine is the duodenum. These pancreaticosplenic are located behind the stomach all along the splenic artery. So then the nodes are really named for the arteries that they're nearby. Um, again, the ones that I've highlighted are the ones that are typically involved in, pylor or, um, in cancers in the pyloric region. So uh, the pyloric lymph nodes, and then again, those can drain into the gastro-mental nodes. So those would also have to be removed because they're upstream. And then everything ends up draining into the celiac nodes, so if the cancer is severe, the celiac nodes would also need to be removed. Gastric ulcers and peptic ulcers refer to open lesions that are present in the stomach and the duodenum. Gastric ulcers are open lesions that are specifically in the mucosa of the stomach, and you can see them here. You can see the little areas um, where there's actually open sores present in the lining of the stomach. Peptic ulcers are open lesions in the mucosa of the pyloric canal or the duodenum. 
So the pyloric canal is literally like the opening or the passageway going into the duodenum. Um, peptic ulcers, though, are, are most commonly in the actual duodenum. Many ulcers are um, associated with a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. H. pylori can actually colonize the stomach. And this is strange. Hey, the stomach, remember, is acidic, extremely acidic. So most bacteria cannot live in the stomach. Um, H. pylori, though, has developed, um, has developed mechanisms to allow it to thrive in this acidic environment. Um, initially, H. pylori actually secretes a compound that neutralizes the acid um, and allows it to persist in the environment while it moves itself um, to a more neutral area. Um, H. pylori also um, has a, a flagellum-like movement that allows it to move to the mucosal environment, so the very um, the mucosal edge of the stomach, where it's more neutral and protected. Um, H. pylori infection, um, or H. pylori creates this or stimulates this kind of inflammatory response in the mucosa, and it erodes or eats away at this protective mucosa that's um, protecting the gastric lining. So the gastric lining ends up being um, eaten away and damaged by the acid and pepsin that are present in the gastric juices. Okay, this is referred to as gastritis when there's inflammation of the gastric lining. Um, H. pylori is a risk factor, so if somebody has the presence of H. pylori infection, which is extremely common, um, it's a risk factor for peptic ulcer disease as well as gastric cancer because um, the constant inflammation and damage to, this, to the tissue can elicit cellular changes that can progress to cancer. Um, we treat H. pylori infection with a combination of antibiotics and PPIs. Um, antibiotics for the bacteria, and then PPIs are proton pump inhibitors that decrease the acidity in the stomach to help decrease the amount of damage that's occurring to the gastric mucosa. Ulcers that are extremely severe can erode deep enough through the gastric wall that they can actually erode the gastric arteries that are present along the lesser curvature of the stomach. Um, this can lead to life-threatening bleeding. Ulcers that are present along the posterior wall of the stomach can erode through the stomach wall and into the pancreas, which sits just posterior to the stomach. Um, this results in referred pain to the back. as opposed to abdominal pain, which you would typically expect with a gastric mm -hmm. ulcer. Um, remember that the splenic artery also runs uh, posterior to the stomach. So if, the, um, if there's a posterior gastric ulcer that erodes the splenic artery, this causes severe hemorrhage into the peritoneal cavity. The vagus nerve controls or um, stimulates most hydrochloric acid secretion by the parietal cells of the stomach. So in the gastric glands, the glands that make gastric juices, there are multiple different types of cells. Um, chief cells, secrete um, <clears throat> the pepsinogen okay, that turns into pepsin that digests proteins. Um, parietal cells secrete the hydrogen and chloride of hydrochloric acid. So the vagus nerve um, controls the parasympathetic innervation into the stomach and stimulates most of this acid secretion. 
So in patients who have chronic ulcers that are caused by excessive production of stomach acid that can't be controlled other ways, we can perform a vagotomy okay, or a surgical sectioning of parts of the vagus nerve in order to stop the secretion of hydrochloric acid. Um, there are multiple different types of vagotomies and you can see them here in the picture. Um, a tranquil vagotomy is obviously the least specific because you are um, sectioning the vagus nerve at the, vas at the vagus trunk. A selective or total gastric phagotomy is completely sectioning the, um, the gastric branches. And then a proximal phagotomy is the most selective of these in that it is only sectioning input to the parietal cells. Peptic ulcers, um, which again are, are most typically duodenal ulcers or ulcer, ulcers in the duodenum, um, typically occur in the posterior wall of the superior duodenum. Um, so they typically occur in the very beginning of the duodenum within three centimeters of the pylorus. And this makes sense, right? If they're associated with acid eating away at the wall or the mucosa, it makes sense that the most acid is present closest to the stomach. The further away from the stomach you get, the more you're neutralizing that acid. And um, so the less likely it is to be getting ulcers. So the, the peptic ulcers are typically occurring um, in the very beginning of the duodenum, close to the stomach where there's the most acid. Um, <clears throat> perforation of the duodenum can allow contents of the duodenum, so the chyme that comes from the stomach, to enter into the peritoneal cavity. Um, and this is problematic, obviously, um, and can lead to peritonitis or an irritation and inflammation of the peritoneal uh, membranes. Erosion of the gastroduodenal artery. Um, that is just posterior to the duodenum can lead to a severe hemorrhage into the peritoneal cavity. And just like we saw when there's a posterior wall gastric ulcer that eats away or erodes away at the splenic artery. Both of these can end up um, bleeding into the peritoneal cavity. Um, this is not common though. Perforation um, of the duodenum is not common. That brings us to the small intestine. And so we started at the terminal esophagus. We went through the stomach, the cardia, fundus, body, and pylorus. And now we're at the small intestine. Um, the small intestine is the part of the um, GI tract that extends from the pylorus of the stomach all the way to the ileocecal junction. The ileocecal junction is where the ileum of the small intestine communicates with the cecum of the large intestine. The small intestine includes three sections from beginning to end. They're the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. We'll start by talking about the duodenum. The duodenum is, again, the first section of the small intestine, and it's the shortest section. Um, it's about 25 centimeters or around 10 inches long, whereas the other sections are like 8 to 12 feet long. The duodenum extends from the pylorus of the stomach, right, which we see right here, into the duodenojejunal junction, which is the connection between the duodenum and the jejunum, right, two sections of the small intestine. When we look at the duodenum, we see that it's kind of broken up into multiple segments, which we'll talk about the four segments in a second. Um, but the first section you can see here referred to as the ampulla. It's this proximal um, kind of dilated area. It's smooth walled compared to the rest of the small intestine. Um, and again, this is just the first two centimeters 
that connects to the pylorus or it, it receives content from the pylorus of the stomach. When we look at the duodenum, you see that it goes, um, <clears throat> like it extends to the right and then down and then back to the left again. And as it does this, it curves around the head of the pancreas. This most distal angle that you see right here um, is referred to as the duodenojejunal flexure. And again, there's this tight flex um, as the duodenum goes up and then curves down again, curves front and down again, and that's the connection between the duodenum and the jejunum. Here you can see the four parts of the duodenum. Um, the first section is referred to as the superior section. Um, this is a relatively short section that's mostly horizontal. Um, it extends across the top of the head of the pancreas at about the level of the L1 vertebra. The second section is the descending section. This is a vertical section that heads down around the head of the pancreas, just right to the inferior vena cava. This second section, the descending section, is the section that receives the um, bile from the bile duct and pancreatic juice from the pancreatic duct. Both the bile duct and the pancreatic duct merge um, and they enter the descending duodenum at the posterior medial wall via a hepatopancreatic ampulla. And let me show you this. So this is your pancreas, right? Um, all down the center, you see this main pancreatic duct. It curves down at the end like this. And then this little green line is showing you the bile duct, which is extending down from right here. So this is the gallbladder. The liver is up here. Um, the cystic duct is coming from the gallbladder. Uh, and then the common hepatic duct is coming from the liver. Those merge with each other. And then right here where they merge is starting the bile duct. Okay, so the bile duct comes down and here you can see in green the very end of it. The bile duct and the main pancreatic duct come together and then they enter into the duodenum right there. Hit the posterior medial wall. That area right where they merge, it's kind of like this little swollen part of a tube that's referred to as the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Um, and there is a sphincter there called the hepatopancreatic sphincter, um, or it's also called the sphincter of Odi, O-D-D-I, um, or the sphincter of the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Um, that, but that controls the release of the bile and the pancreatic juice into the duodenum. So the um, superior part is this horizontal part, then the descending part goes down vertically, and then the inferior section, the third section, is another horizontal section um, <clears throat> that extends back towards the left side of the body at about the level of the body of L3. So we started at the body of L1, and then we went down to the, the level of the body of the L3 vertebra. The inferior section heads back towards the left. Um, it crosses anterior to the inferior vena cava and the aorta. So it's crossing over the top of, you see here, the inferior vena cava and the aorta. But it's posterior behind the superior mesenteric artery and vein. And that's what you see here. This is the superior mesenteric vein. This is the superior mesenteric artery. They cross over the top um, of the inferior portion of the duodenum. The last section of the duodenum is the ascending portion. This ascends, right? It rises up just left of the aorta to the body of the pancreas. Okay? It, it stops at the inferior border of the body of the pancreas. And then at that, at that part, at the level of the pancreas, it curves forward. Um, that's that flexure um, and joins the duodenum or becomes the duodenum. So like right here, it comes forward and then flexes down.
Arterial supply to the duodenum uh, come, um, comes from two different sources, and this represents a transition in the blood supply of the alimentary canal, um, or GI tract. <clears throat> so there's a transition in the blood supply of the GI tract that occurs in the duodenum, and this transition point where we switch from one ar arterial supply to the next occurs right where the bile duct uh, and the pancreatic duct are entering the duodenum. This is the site um, where during development in the embryo, there's the junction. So this is the junction point between the four gut and the mid gut. During embryonic development. So this is the junction point. Um, the duodenal arteries then are going to arise from two different sources, um, where the foregut is coming in from the celiac trunk and where the midgut is from the superior mesenteric artery. So the gastroduodenal artery um, and the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery are derived from the celiac trunk. Um, the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery is derived from the superior mesenteric artery. Okay, so the artery is coming from the celiac trunk, that's representing the foregut. The artery is coming from the superior mesenteric artery is representing the midgut. And again, this is the, the transition point um, during embryonic development. However, um, there is an astomosis that occurs. The superior and inferior pancreaticoduodenal arteries anastomose connect, and this forms collateral circulation between the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. Venous drainage from the duodenum um, follows the same names, the same arteries, and eventually goes into the hepatic portal vein. Here you guys can see that arterial supply and you can see how um, blood flow to the duodenum, right, which this is the duodenum, is originating from the celiac trunk, right, up here, and then the um, superior mesenteric artery, which we see right here. From the celiac trunk, right, follow, we have um, the, the hepatic artery, right, and then coming from the hepatic artery, you have the superior pancreaticoduodenal artery. Okay, and that comes down and ends up eventually feeding the duodenum. Over here, we see um, the superior mesenteric artery. And the superior mesenteric artery gives us the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery. Okay, which comes over here to the duodenum. So the two origination points are the celiac trunk and then the superior mesenteric artery. The celiac trunk ends up giving us branches to all the structures of the foregut. The inferior mesenteric artery gives, or sorry, the superior mesenteric artery gives us the branches that go to the midgut. Okay. Um, you can see that they anastomose though, right? So this interconnection between them again is, is an important um, interconnection between the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. After the duodenum, the next two sections of the small intestine are the jejunum and ileum. The jejunum and ileum extend from the duodeno-jejunal junction, right, that tight little flexure where the duodenum goes into the jejunum, all the way to the ileocecal junction. The ileocecal junction is the union of the ileum and the cecum, which is the small intestine going into the large intestine. And you see that happening here. Okay, so the ileum, the small intestine, is coming into the cecum. The cecum is this first pouch of the large intestine. So you can see all the small intestine is curled up in here. 
the small or the uh, dredgen and manilium um, are between six to seven meters long in cadavers. Uh, in a living person, there's this tonic contraction that's constantly occurring that makes it um, much shorter as it's folded up in the abdomen. Um, but when completely relaxed and stretched out, it is between six and seven meters long, which is really long. About two-fifths of this length is the jejunum, and three-fifths is the ilium. So the ilium is the longest section of the small intestine. The um, jejunum and ilium are supported by another double layer of peritoneum, um, another membrane that is referred to as the mesentery, or also mesentery proper. Uh, this is a fan-shaped layer, um, double layer of peritoneum or a fan-shaped membrane that anchors the jejunum and ilium to the posterior abdominal wall. And you can see um, a representation of it here. Arterial supply to the jejunum and ilium is via the superior mesenteric artery. Um, the superior mesenteric artery sends branches out to all of the rest of the small intestine. Branches unite to form um, loops that are referred to as arterial arcades. And then we have um, straight arteries that come off of the loops that are referred to as the vasa recta. So here, just looking at this, um, remember the abdominal aorta is coming down. And this first branch off of it is the celiac trunk. And then the abdominal aorta continues down. And then the next branch that comes off right here is the superior mesenteric artery. So you see the superior mesenteric artery coming down, right, mesenterically through the mesentery, which was this, this membrane that we see everywhere. Um, the superior mesenteric artery then has branches that come off of it. There are jejunal branches going to the jejunum and ileal branches going to the ilium. Off of the branches, you see these curves, right? The curves are called arterial arcades. Then coming off of the arterial arcades, are the vessels of the vasa recta. So all of these straight vessels are vasa recta. We see this pattern a lot. We'll see the same pattern in the kidneys, for example, where like there are vessels that come that branch, then there's a curve, and then little tiny straight ones off of that. Um, it's a really common pattern that we see. Venous drainage from the jejunum and ilium is via the superior mesenteric vein, which are just like the artery, but the opposite, going the other way. The superior mesenteric vein, remember, merges with the splenic vein, and this forms the hepatic portal vein. So eventually, the blood that's drained from the jejunum and ilium, it's going to go to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. So let's just take a second on this slide and look at portal circulation as a whole. Here we see the inferior vena cava, right, coming down the abdomen. Um, looking down here, you see the hepatic portal vein going into the liver. The hepatic portal vein is formed via the union of the splenic vein coming from the spleen and the superior mesenteric vein coming from the small intestine and then part of the large intestine. Also notice that there are these small gastric veins that are going into the hepatic portal vein. Now, before the splenic vein merges with the superior mesenteric vein, it accepts blood from the inferior mesenteric vein over here. Okay, so you have your inferior mesenteric vein merging with a splenic vein. Then the splenic vein is merging with the superior mesenteric vein. And that forms the hepatic portal vein. 
So the hepatic portal vein is taking blood from all of these abdominal organs and carrying it into the liver. The liver then processes that blood and then the blood leaves the liver via the normal hepatic veins. And that goes into the inferior vena cava. Um, the reason for this portal circulation is that the blood that's coming from the spleen and the stomach um, and the intestines needs to be processed before it goes into general circulation. Um, the intestines, for example, we're absorbing a ton of nutrients from the intestines. And the blood that's coming from the intestines is so packed with nutrients that we can't just send it out into circulation. We need to process it. So the blood goes to the liver and the liver you know, converts glucose into glycogen and amino acids into proteins. Um, and there's all of this, this kind of storage of nutrients that occurs um, before the blood goes you know, through the hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava and into general circulation. Also think about like the spleen. Um, <clears throat> the spleen is one of the areas where macrophages clean out old red blood cells, right? And in that process, we generate wastes um, like uh, bilirubin, for example. So that bilirubin has to be cleaned out of the blood from the liver. So we take this blood from the spleen, right? In the hepatic portal circulation, we send it to the liver. The liver cleans that bilirubin out, it puts it in the bile, and then the blood goes back into general circulation. Okay, so there's a reason that this blood goes through hepatic portal circulation. Um, without hepatic portal circulation, all of this blood would just go straight into the inferior vena cava, and that blood is not ready for general circulation. Okay, so it's important that we have this stopover point here Right, this second set of capillary beds in the liver so we can process the nutrients, clean out the wastes, and then we send the blood into general circulation. Um, ileal diverticulum, or it's also called Meckel's diverticulum, is a congenital abnormality that occurs in one to two percent of people, and it's a diverticulum that's present in the ilium. A diverticulum is a pouch, like a little outcropping or a, a little pouch that's not typically there. Um, an ileal diverticulum is, or Meckel's diverticulum, is a remnant of the embryonic yolk stalk that ends up forming a little three to six centimeter outcropping or a little um, like finger-like pouch that extends out of the ilium. It's located on the border of the intestine opposite the mesenteric attachment. So opposite, remember the mesentery is the double layer membrane that connects to this small intestine. So the mesentery connects on one side of the intestine, the other side of the intestine has the outcropping or the diverticulum. Um, <clears throat> this diverticulum can become inflamed and that's painful and the pain from an ileal diverticulum can mimic appendicitis. So that's something to always have in the back of your mind. Here you see, this is the small intestine, right? This is the mesentery. Again, it's a fatty membrane, um, but you see the mesentery attaching on around here. And then the opposite side, this is the outcropping, right? This is the diverticulum. Diverticulosis is a disorder where there's multiple um, false diverticula or little um, outpouchings of the mucosa, like the diverticulum, um, that form along the intestine. Most frequently it occurs in the colon and specifically the sigmoid colon, the last section um, of the colon. It's most common um, in middle age and elderly, so in older individuals, it becomes more common. Um, if there's no inflammation or infection or a rupture, it's typically asymptomatic. Um, however, the diverticula can um, become infected and inflamed and can rupture. And when they're inflamed, this, re this is called um, diverticulitis. When there's uh, inflammation and diverticulitis is present, then it's typically associated with pain. 
most commonly the pain is in the left lower quadrant um, and the left lower quadrant is where the sigmoid colon is so this makes sense here you can see uh, a drawing of diverticulosis so with diverticulosis there's just little outcroppings of the mucosa um, <clears throat> but there's no infection or inflammation present with diverticulitis now there is inflammation present, and this is when pain occurs.